Thanks. Okay, so hi, my name is Melody Ma, and my team and I spent the semester researching countermeasures against spaceflight osteopenia. Okay, so today I'm going to be introducing spaceflight osteopenia's like specific relevancy to a microgravity environment, as well as symptoms and treatments currently being researched. And then I'll end with some discussion about the trajectory that research is taking. Okay, so this is my amazing team and I had a lot of fun like working with them this semester and so I'm excited to share our findings with you. Okay, so what is spaceflight osteopenia? Um, like before I get into the details about what osteopenia is, I think it's really important that I like specifically go over the unique conditions of spaceflight. So during their travels, astronauts experience weightlessness due to microgravity. Um, and this reduces like mechanical stress on the body and it takes less energy to perform an action. And then so another factor that they experience is ionizing radiation, which is caused by um, the lack of protection from the ozone, which is different um, from UV radiation that we experience on Earth in that it is much more severe um, and it has both acute and chronic impairments that include like nausea, fatigue, um, and then like heightened risks of cancer and cardiac diseases. And so osteopenia man manifests in the body as like a loss of bone density, which makes them a lot weaker. And the image on the right um, shows a different level of porousness um, with osteopenia at the midpoint between like normal bone and osteoporosis. So it's kind of like a transition state between those two things. And then for an overview, bone growth is a dynamic process. Um, it's constantly being formed and reduced in a mechanism that we call remodeling. And remodeling operates through two types of bone cells. So osteoblasts form bone while osteoclasts uh, regulate mineral levels and they ensure like maintenance. And then so during space flight, like this homeostasis gets disrupted and resorption of chemicals like calciums gets reduced as a result. And also osteopenia is regional and it affects different parts of the body differently. And unfortunately, like recovery from osteopenia is long term and it may continue to affect the health of astronauts when they make their return to Earth. Okay, so here I'm going to share some pretty shocking statistics. So in the 9 to 12 day Apollo mission, astronauts experienced a 2% loss of bone. And then um, after six months, trabecular bone was reduced by 24%. And then finally, bone loss per month in the spine, pelvis, and proximal femur was just over 1%. And so, like, as if those statistics, like, weren't compelling enough, um, the, glo the global osteoporosis treatment market was valued at over 10 billion US dollars in 2018. And we know that like one in four women and one in 20 men above the age of 65 suffer from osteoporosis. So that indicates a high demand and, and an increased need for a viable and cost-effective treatment. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the details and the causes as well as the biological mechanisms behind osteopenia. So the like handwritten diagram on the left describes the general metabolic pathway that regulates bone health. And so you can see that like the process of the osteoclast getting activated. Um, so inflammation activates the T cells, um, which activate the osteoblastic stromal cells, and they have a ligand called rank L. And this connects to the osteoclast precursor in the yellow, um, which has the receptor IKB kinase, which phosphorylates the inhibitor of kappa B and then freeze NFKB. And so we know that NFKB like transcribes genes and this allows osteoclasts to be formed for bone resorption and calcium release. And then in the purple and green inhibitors, denosumab and OPG um, reduce activation of osteoclasts to decrease degradation of the bone matrix. And then that brings us to the second diagram. 
So skeletal muscle mass is directly related to bone health through a process, process that we know as um, bone muscle crosstalk. So myokines are released from muscle and they interact with bone activity. And then simultaneously, osteokines are released from bone and th those interact with muscle. So one myokine in particular is pretty important. Um, myostatin reduces muscle growth to prevent hypertrophy. And so, so some of the causes are um, like when this balance between muscle and bone is disrupted, um, you end up with osteopenia. And this occurs specifically when there is more breakdown than buildup, uh, which is influenced by like many pathways in the body, as I just described, um, as well as factors in overall bone health. And then in addition, um, different hormones and environmental factors also play a role in how these cells are working. And going into space has like uh, systemic effects that can heighten osteoclast activity. And so like an example of this is mechanical stress or decreases in mechanical stress, which change how osteoblasts and osteoclasts are working. Um, and another change is like hormone imbalances because those regulate osteoclast, uh, the osteoclast pathway. An example is like calcium homeostasis regulated by the pituitary uh, gland affects bone health. And then finally, like ionizing radiation can affect gene transcription and cells overall, which can impact how the cells are working. And then mechanical stress is one of the biggest factors on bone health. Um, blood flow in bones is heavily altered in space and mechanical loading with these fluid forces um, maintains the general structure within cells. And the body will in turn address this by increasing osteoclast activity. And so we know that there are two types of bone tissue. Cortical uh, bone is compact and dense and it forms a protective like outer shell around marrow while trabecular is more spongy and designed for strength but um, both of these types of bone experience the same losses in space and that can occur like within the same bone. And then the image below depicts this type of loss, but measurements that are not visual include mass, density, torsion, and compression. Okay, so what are some of the known symptoms? So in flight, Musculoskeletal symptoms are pain, stiffness, or fatigue at muscles, bones, ligaments, tendons, and nerves, and then bone fragility where weight is concentrated, um, such as the hip. And then post-flight persistent structural deficits after space flight could be worsened by, oops, by changes um, induced by microgravity. And this predisposes long duration astronauts to fractures at an earlier age. Okay, so now I'm gonna get into the current treatments for spaceflight osteopenia. So non-medical treatments are making structural alterations to the spacecraft. Um, artificial gravity can be created by centrifugal force, um, but the drawbacks are that it can cause nausea and requires a significant amount of energy over a sustained period of time. And in addition, the rotation can change the orbit of the spacecraft and like the distribution of forces will change depending on where you are on the spacecraft. So like if you're closer to the center, you're not gonna feel um, as much force as you will if you're like farther away from the center. So there's a lot of like unevenness. And then medical in treatments include nutrition, um, pharmaceuticals and physical exercise. Vitamin D and calcium are good options. Um, and you can find those in like milk, fish and eggs. And then bisphosphonates are like pretty popular. Um, they're a type of medication that's commonly prescribed for osteoporosis and other like bone density patients on earth, um, which work by reducing osteoclast activity. And then physical exercise is also a heavily used option but it comes with quite a few drawbacks. So physical exercise is effective at inhibiting osteoclast activity on earth, um, but it requires like specific machines, as you can see. Free weights are obviously not an option um, in a microgravity environment. So astronauts use negative pressure for resistance. Um, so it's pretty clear that osteogenic stimulus from exercise like has been inadequate to maintain bone mass just 
due to insufficient load or duration through exercise. And then biphosphonates um, are another current treatment. And these focus on the decreasing function of the osteoclast um, and the osteoclast mediated bone resorption. Okay, so the mechanism of action begins by stimulating osteoclast apoptosis, otherwise known as cell death. And then this decreases the number of osteoclasts and that in turn decreases the effect of bone resorption or bone loss. And then simultaneously, it inhibits the cholesterol synthetic pathway, which decreases the osteoclast differentiation and therefore their function. Okay, and then bisphosphonates are like generally administered intravenously or orally, and they must be taken like on an empty stomach. And some of the drawbacks are that only 50% of the BPNs that are absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract reach the bones. They can also cause GI irritation. So they have to be taken with non-mineral water because mineral water can actually cause poisoning. Um, and the patient must also be upright for 30 minutes. And then high doses and sustained periods of therapy can cause hypercalcemia or too much calcium in the blood, which can cause parts of the bone, specifically in the jaw, to die due to a lack of oxygen. And then of course, um, the microgravity environment contributes another complication for the administration of these drugs. Um, so air bubbles tend to linger in liquids because there isn't gravity to pull the liquid down. Um, and this like poses an issue for medication administered through an IV or injected into the vein. And then as well, um, shelf life is also low and storage is limited, which is another obstacle for long-term therapy. Um, but on like a more positive note, there is a lot of room to explore solutions. So the majority of like the current pharmacological interventions could be classed as like resorption prevention drugs, which means that they focus on how osteoclasts are differentiating, how they're maturing and like how they're activated. And so bisphosphonates are a good example of this. Um, but on the formation side of the equation, um, preventing osteoblast cell death um, is also of interest and a number of anabolic or like bone building drugs with uncertain mechanisms are also being explored. Um, microRNAs, which were identified using microarrays during osteoblast differentiation are like chemical messengers that regulate gene expression. And so silencing microRNAs were found to induce calcium release through the CAV 1.2 protein, I believe. And then a study that was done on mice um, found that like when you target its silent, you can you you target its silencing, it helps um, preserve bone mass, microstructure, and strength. Um, but microRNAs control a lot of bodily functions. So it's it's risky like what you silence because you might be affecting um, other physiological functions. And then microRNAs are also just one example of like how focusing on different elements of bone muscle crosstalk can be like an effective method of treating spaceflight osteopenia. But because the pathway is complex and many different ligands and their respective physiological functions are involved, um, future research should capitalize on the multitude of potential strategies to combat bone degradation. Okay, so that is the end of the presentation. Cool. Thank you, Melody. Um, that was, uh, you know, um, like you covered all the main topics uh, regarding osteo osteopenia. And I guess I have a few questions for you. So number one, osteopenia and osteoporosis, I guess they both uh, affect the cortical bone as well as the trabecular bone. Is that correct? Yeah. 
Okay, all right. So, okay, so, so I take it the trabecular bone is where most of the strength when the bone comes from? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, in your research, like, do you see, you know, uh, I, I sometimes I approach uh, all these um, conditions with kind of a common sense kind of mentality. And to me, it just seems kind of surprising that osteoporosis is such a severe condition as opposed to osteopenia. You would think that people traveling in outer space would suffer a lot more from, from bone loss, but it's actually the people on earth who, are, who have like the more severe condition. So at the molecular mechanism, can you like kind of explain what, why in osteoporosis it's just so it's just so much more severe for us? Yeah, okay. So osteoporosis like is more severe because it's like the the stage after osteopenia um, where like bone density is like really um, changing and like I think that image that I showed that had like normal bone and then osteopenia and then osteoporosis like kind of in a line together showed osteopenia like in the middle um, and that's kind of like the transition state between the normal state of bone and then osteoporosis after you've experienced all of that like bone mass loss and so osteopenia is like when you're lacking minerals and you haven't yet like experienced the symptoms of not having like bone volume. Yes, I, I see, thank you. So Melody, the, the medications that people are giving to astronauts, I am assuming that they're giving it to patients with osteoporosis also? Um, yeah, I think like it depends on, um, it depends on the circumstances. So I know that like a lot of osteoporosis patients tend to be like menopausal women and increasing estrogen levels um, is like a, is a pretty common way that um, menopausal women are treated um, just because like when you increase estrogen, you increase the formation of bone. But um, obviously like astronauts in space are not suffering from those same symptoms. So they won't be treated with like uh, like hormone therapy. And so we're really looking to like specifically focus in on the conditions of microgravity. Hmm. I see. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Melody. Um, yeah, I'm just course. curious as to, um, as to what you think, you know, um, from your research, you probably come a lot of interesting facts and factoids and whatnot. So what were some of the most striking things that you learned uh, during your research so far? Yeah, I think what I was really like fascinated by was just like the, some of the like receptors that are involved in the process of like bone formation are also like involved in a lot of other functions in the body. And so when we were trying to like um, circumvent some of the effects of those receptors for um, active in type 2B, um, that one is also related to like obesity and diabetes. Um, and so it was like pretty striking to see how those were related. And if we're like um, inhibiting like certain parts of the body, you might also be inhibiting like a really important bodily function and just like how everything is interconnected. So you have to be like really careful about where you're targeting and like where you're focusing on and what those surrounding um, consequences might be. I see, very interesting. Thank you so much, Melody. Yeah, of course.